So anything that happens in Sri Lanka, for us, nobody in India should look at it as something that our leaders, regardless of what political party, we are a very divided country. We have, you know, politicians who hate each other, like here probably. <laughs> but whoever is in office, nobody will do anything that is a threat to India knowingly. Uh, with India, I must stress at this point, you saved us last year. Uh, because at that time last year, when we were in crisis, nobody came forward to help us. It was India who came forward. Four billion dollars last year, that is a lot of money. And it was no questions asked. And then after that, the international community was also slow to step forward. India went out there, Mrs. Sitaraman went out there, Dr. Jayashankar went out there, Mr. Ajit Doval went out there and said, help Sri Lanka. Milind Moragoda is a Sri Lankan politician, diplomat and business person. He described the present, recent past and the future of Sri Lanka in this particular episode. If you're someone who enjoys the geopolitical podcast of TRS, this is the one for you. I absolutely love bringing on international guests on the show in order to learn more about their mindsets and their cultures and of course the countries. If you're a Sri Lankan listener, I hope that I have done justice to your country's story in this particular podcast. I won't elaborate too much more on the episode. I'll let you slip into this geopolitics special of TRS. Milan, sir, welcome to India, I guess. At least digital India. How are you, sir? Okay, and thank you for inviting me. And thank you. It's a privilege to meet you. I, I watched several of your programs. And so it's great being here. No, no, we are honored. Uh, this is the first time we're hosting a Sri Lankan on the show. So I'm going to talk to you very openly about how India feels about Sri Lanka. It could be argued that Sri Lanka is the most geopolitically important part of the world right now. In some ways. Well, my ego is, our ego is big, but we wouldn't want to think it's exactly that. But uh, it is an important place. It is an, and, and it has, it's not recent. I mean, you asked about ancient Sri Lanka throughout our history. Our leaders, our kings have had to live with this because yeah. of the location. I mean, everything I've learned about geopolitics, I've learned on the show. <laughs> so I'm relaying whatever my inputs are. And these are definitely from slightly extremist mindsets because they make great podcasts. <laughs> Okay, so pardon me if I am crossing a no, line no, or no, saying no, anything no, wrong no, with you. No, That's not, not my intention. Not my intention is to learn, especially the Sri Lankan geopolitical uh, narrative. And of course, I have questions about the economic crisis and all of that. Of course. Uh, but I want to begin by uh, asking you if you're aware of how much tension there is between India and China to the degree where even people who watch the show probably are united by this dislike about China. They might be divided because of religion, belief systems, political uh, affiliations. Everyone dislikes China. That's how much dislike there is for China right now. Um, to the degree where Chinese products are looked down upon, Chinese brands are rejected. Uh, and I think the average Indian YouTube podcast consumer is also very aware of the whole Haban Tota port uh, situation in Sri Lanka. Uh, long story short, I'm going to give you a short version of what I have learned through YouTube channels like Think School. Uh, and then please correct me or give me the Sri Lankan perspective. Uh, China is like renowned to give bad loans to countries uh, who are in economic need. Those loans are not easy to pay back. And uh, China's contracts are slightly vague. So eventually what happens is if you can't pay China back, you have to part ways with an asset which in the case of Sri Lanka and China was that Habantota port. Now that particular port is extremely important commercially, geopolitically, etc. And there are parts of India and people in India who feel extremely threatened that I believe even a Chinese warship was parked there as recently as last year. So uh, there is this cultural friendliness between uh, India and Sri Lanka. But because of this Chinese uh, existence at that Habantota port. And there is a Chinese existence within Sri Lanka as well. Um, India is just feeling slightly concerned. 
प्लीज गिव मी द श्रीलंकन नैरेटिव सो करेक्ट मी इफ हैव सेड समथिंग रॉन्ग एंड आई एम वेरी सॉरी इफ हैव लाइक क्रॉस्ड द लाइन नो नो आई एम ट्राइंग टू थिंक हाउ टू स्टार्ट द आंसर बिकॉज़ बी अ लॉन्ग आंसर बट लेट मी टेक योर टाइम स्टार्ट इट फ्रॉम समवेयर वेयर फर्स्टली व्हाट आई सेड आई मीन श्रीलंकाज लोकेशन हैज बीन ऑलवेज आवर बिगेस्ट अपॉर्चुनिटी एंड आवर बिगेस्ट चैलेंज opportunity because if we use it properly we could we could have and we still could become a very fast growing country and with a with we almost for us we can be the gateway into the indian subcontinent yeah. like what hong kong could be to china or the netherlands is into europe it can be the gateway equally yes geopolitically speaking whoever controls the oceans controls the world in many ways one way of looking at it especially throughout history it has been that and sure. and, and sri lanka has a very strategic port which is trincomalee it's uh, hambantota is not really a strategic port uh, trincomalee is where i think uh, which is the second largest natural harbor in the world it can bring in any ship that has been built by man it's a natural blessing that we have where is it in the northeast part it's eastern part of sri lanka gotcha and it's a beautiful place if you ever visit that you know the outer harbor of trincomalee there is an indian air sorry a uk a british aircraft carrier hms hermes which sank from the, during the second world war it sank there and it's right at the bottom and divers go down there to look at fish uh despite that you can bring in any ship that has been built even over there it's so deep and it's naturally deep so that is the strategic port and throughout recent history there has been always this fear that somebody would get hold of trincomalee both it could be a threat to the region but also people are worried globally now for example we are talking of the geopolitics today in the 1980s uh, sri lanka was perceived to be by some in india being too close to the americans because the then president was quite close to president reagan and uh, because of that we had a lot of tension with india it's probably the most difficult period with india that we went through was in the 1980s when we this perception was there that india was too close uh, sri lanka rather was too close to the americans now today we have a similar situation at times with china because geopolitics change we cannot as a small country control geopolitics uh, because india is a superpower now us is there as a superpower china is there taking superpower in a broader sense uh, and we are we are we can't control that we have to accept that as it is but the only uh, uh, policy that we have as sri lanka is that we cannot be in any way seen to be a threat to india because we are part of geog- geographically we are part of uh, we are civilizationally the same yes we discuss that our blood is the same we discuss that but geographically we are the same so anything that happens in sri lanka for us, nobody in india should look at it as something that our leaders regardless of what political party we are a very divided country we have you know politicians who hate each other like here probably <laughs> but whoever is in office nobody will do anything that is a threat to india knowingly now the issue is sometimes through commercial transactions and other activities is it perceived that what we are doing is a threat to india that's where the quality of the dialogue matters between our leaders whoever the leaders and now recently our president was here he met with prime minister modi they had lunch alone together just the two of them which is i think important with leaders they need to talk to each other we are diplomats we are intermediaries really conversations must take place between leaders Because so the he, decisions come from there they come from there and opinions are also formed there okay so the two leaders met dr jay shankar and our president had a private dinner together nsa doval and the president had private breakfast together so that they could understand each other and to make sure we keep communicating because china there is a chinese investment in hambantota our perspective is that it is a commercial investment there are many in delhi that believe that it is there is a military dimension i think to it. our whole country believes it's a military so, so, dimension so therefore we need to see how we can ensure that uh, we we don't uh, you don't have that impression so you recently now you mentioned about a ship which came last year that was a missile tracking vessel it it was not a warship but it was a missile tracking vessel but today i mean you know technology 
uh, there is dual use technology. You can use something to track a, track a, uh, a uh, missile or you can use something to track a weather satellite. So this vessel was seen to be by, by on the Indian side as being something that could be used for either purpose. Now, our people had approved it on the basis of a research vessel because they thought this was a tracking vessel that was used for, uh, for, for more, let's say, benign purposes. But uh, there were others who believed that it is, could be used for uh, military purposes. So we had a conversation on that. And the, in the future also, we will have to have conversations as because China is a power that is present in the Indian Ocean. They do uh, send ships across. And, and uh, so we will have to have a conversation to ensure that uh, India and we are aligned in, on, this, on, on what, what is a threat. Because what we have taken the position is what is a threat to India is a threat to us. So then when it comes to the debt issue with China, which you also touched upon, uh, I don't think we have got caught into an Indian debt, uh, sorry, uh, the Chinese debt trap at all. I mean, we borrowed from China. We used it for, for uh, investments in roads, in uh, ports. We used it that way. But we have not, uh, we, we have to now restructure that debt. And that negotiation is complicated because the Chinese have a different worldview of how the international monetary, the financial system should be run as opposed to the rest of the world. This is a serious issue because they feel that they, 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 they feel that they would like to redefine some aspects of the international financial system. So they are not accepting the Bretton Woods institutions, you know, like the World Bank and the IMF, the Paris Club. And what, uh, let's say, uh, India would also believe. So th that is the issue there, how we renegotiate that debt. That is going on. Uh, with India, I must stress at this point, you saved us last year. I mean, that is something I would like your audience. I know it's it's a younger audience and I want to impress upon. I also promise you Dr. Jayashankar will be watching this. Well, I watched his program, so I hope he watches ours. But uh, basically, he played a very important role. Uh, because at that time last year, uh, here when we were in crisis, nobody came forward to help us. It was India who came forward. $4 billion last year, that is a lot of money. And it was no questions asked. That's how it happened. And 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 uh, if you had not stepped in at the time, we would have had bloodshed. Uh, we, I mean, we, we were spared bloodshed last year. We had a change in president, but it happened in a peaceful way. And then after that, the international community was also slow to step forward. India went out there, Mrs. Sitaraman went out there, Dr. Jayashankar went out there, Mr. Ajit Doval went out there and said, help Sri Lanka. So the, the, when uh, the, on the debt restructuring you referred to, uh, the, when, the, when the, uh, everybody was slow on making a commitment, India gave a letter of financing assurances saying, we are willing to take the lead in that. And now, of course, the conversation is going on with the rest of the world and with China also, how to do it. But China has a different way of doing things. So that is the challenge. I mean, that's a challenge for you. That's a challenge for us. So, but on the security side, all I can say is from the point of view, our leaders, regardless of political parties in office, Sri Lanka does not want to be perceived as in any way helping uh, uh, the security, uh, uh, harming the security of India. Because we have an understanding on both sides. I think India also has always looked out for us in the recent past. When we had even recently, when we had a, a terrorist bombing, India warned us also in advance when whatever information they had about that. So they have been always very uh, responsive. So in our case, there is no intention here on that. But perceptions are important to clear. I think that's what you are saying. Yeah. Uh, what I will definitely say is I've learned a lot about geopolitics through the show. I learned even more when I actually got to speak to our cabinet ministers. This is the energy I picked up. I might be slightly wrong in saying some of these things, but I feel India is, again, very economically driven. We're a country where in our point in our timeline, we want to make money. We want to build businesses. We want to take India back to being the Soniki Chidya, which means the golden mm. sparrow. Okay, we want to become rich again. We don't want no shit with nobody. That's the honest truth. Yes. Like we don't want fights. Right. But I also know very intensely, uh, it's the era of Dr. Jai Shankar. Mm. So if someone messes with us, we'll mess back. Uh, we don't want fights with China, but they seem to be the aggressors right now. 
where if they line up on our borders in uh, Ladakh or if they stop their ships in that Hamantota port, I don't think we'll back down either because that's just the spirit right now of India, which is why these conversations are important and it's important for me to be very straightforward with you also, sir. Yeah. Uh, while I know that the decision makers are in um, the ministries right now in our two countries, uh, it's important for me as a youth oriented podcaster to ask you these questions and to bring up these topics and i don't mean to no, make no, this no i think that there is it's important and one way of getting over this problem is also what we are discussing now that is how to integrate the sri lankan economy better with the indian economy because i think if that happens this conversation the geopolitical conversation becomes in a way less relevant so this time when our president visited here there was a joint economic uh, vision that was put forward between uh, President Vikramasinghe and Prime Minister Modi. And in that, we talk of integration at different levels. One is connectivity, connectivity in the context of having a, a oil pipeline connectivity, uh, electricity cable connectivity, and even prospectively a road connecting India and Sri Lanka. I mean, this is just 50 kilometers or less. I mean, depending how you measure it, uh, it's not a big distance and it's very shallow as well. And so through that process, then we are talking of ferries, aviation. Then when the two economies get integrated that way, then there is less reason to be insecure. Then uh, there is, uh, we are talking of trade where we can open out more. We have a free trade agreement, but we are looking at going beyond that. We have also now rupee as a currency, Indian rupee to be used in trade. And then investments, to have more bigger investments coming from India to Sri Lanka. And especially now as we restructure our economy, how can we, how can we get more Indian companies to come in? Now, if this is done, I think the, the, we will be seen to be less remote. Because at the moment, you know, we seem to be still too far away. Although we talk of all these civilizational links and blood links and all that, still it's too far away. Now, you went to Sri Lanka. Did you see any hostility towards no, the Indians? No. no, not at all. And you felt comfortable? Loved you, it. So that, that, that is, so now if we connect more, you know, I have a theory that if we can get more school kids in Sri Lanka to visit India, even whether it's Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, very soon, these misunderstandings will go away. Because uh, th then your politics will be not what we will be talking about. I feel that we will then be talking about something else. I'll tell you, I might be wrong in saying this, but the perception I get is, geopolitically speaking, India looks at Sri Lanka as a brother. But right now, a so-called enemy, China, uh, is just positioning itself near our brother. That's how we're looking at it. Uh, and it's happening more and more from a geopolitical perspective. No, no, that is true. I mean, I, when I mentioned, uh, you see, in the 80s, when this perception was there with the Americans also, because at that time, US and India were not close, uh, we, had the, we had similar challenges. So we have to, on our side, learn from that. And I think from India's side, also learn from it and make sure we don't leave any, any, any daylight there. We have to work quickly. And now I see that difference because there is close communication between our leaders. Okay. And that is what is extremely important because a lot of these things come through misunderstandings. Wow. And the, 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 when you look at now Hambantota port, for example, uh, originally, uh, Sri Lanka offered it to India to develop. We needed to develop the port. But uh, at that time, there were no real port developers in India who were, who were in a position to Roughly, do that. when was this, sir? This was in the early 2000s when this was discussed initially. It was offered to India at that what, time. Do you know if it was the Atal Bihari Vajpayee government? No, I think or? it was probably Congress government at the time, I think. Probably and they wouldn't. didn't take up no, the opportunity. It was more than the government. I think the problem was you did not have strong port developers at the time uh, who could do it at the time. And there was no interest at I, that time. I don't know. I mean, I know the entrepreneurial spirit of India. Mukesh Ambani was rich even then. He was, but I don't think he was doing ports. Now, now if you look at it, I mean, take a concrete case of Mr. Adani. He is developing a terminal in Sri Lanka. And, and uh, he, he invested last year when the height of our crisis, when nobody would invest in Sri Lanka, he came and invested. 
I, I mean, we are very grateful for him for that because he he took that risk. Because if you look at Colombo Port, uh, this is something else when it comes to port. The Hambantota is 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 not a big port, although there is a strategic issue. I, I don't deny that. Colombo is our main port, main commercial port. Eighty percent of the business of Colombo Port is transshipment business. Of that, around seventy-five percent goes to India. So Colombo Port is an Indian port, really. I mean, doing business with India. That's the main market. India is the main market. Uh, so therefore, uh, because you don't have deep water ports in India, you don't have that many. So Colombo has deep water terminal. So the big the big ships come there. And they unload, and the small ships take the, the the cargo into India. So and in reverse. So now we are looking at now with uh, Adani Group uh, investment, we are looking at developing uh, a, a port with India. At that time, there were the, that kind of private sector presence was not there. This was a more recent part of recent development. Were you in politics at that time, which you are talking about? Where it yes, was I was in politics. I was, I think. I, I was I, I can't remember where I was, but I would have been somewhere in politics at that. I'm time. sure you were involved in the conversation at least to a degree. Yeah, at least yes. you had a deeper understanding than the average Indian or the average. Definitely, Indian. definitely. Which is why I want to ask you um, about that particular loan that Sri Lanka took from China. I believe it was a billion dollar loan in order to develop that port. Why did Sri Lanka agree to take that loan from China? Was it because the World Bank was denying? Uh, no, for the port, Sri Lanka. You see, the south of Sri Lanka is in Sri Lanka. The two most undeveloped, underdeveloped areas are the north and the south. North is where the Tamil community by and large resides, and that area there has to be more to be done to develop. And now that is that that the programs for that are going, and that's where the war was. In the deep south is also very poor, so there was a need for a port in the deep south. And uh, the, the every government that was in office would talk about this during elections and was not able to deliver once they were in office. So the president at that time, President Mahindra Rajapaksa, he took a decision that somehow we must try to uh, to build a port in the deep south. In fact, he came from Hambantota. That was his hometown. That was his constituency also. So they looked around. They, they, nobody was interested from the private sector side to do it. They looked for financing. They were not able to get it. And finally, yes, because nobody else was available, China gave the financing. Then subsequently, what happened was that uh, when, uh, when, when, when much after the port was built, uh, the, 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 there was a line of thinking that we had to reduce our debt, which which is which is correct. I mean, we had too much debt across the board, and so therefore. That's when this debt equity, if you want to call it that, I mean, it was basically it was swapped for a loan. A loan was swapped for a lease of the port. That's when it was done to try to improve our situation as far as our economic balance was concerned. So that's how it happened. Yeah, I'm really happy on a personal level that I get to have a conversation with someone of your stature on my show. Like, it's crazy to think that. This is adding to geopolitical narrative somewhat. I know it's going to reach leadership in India. No, I know your program is watched widely. And do you think it would reach leadership in Sri Lanka as well? Possibly. I, I think definitely we will, of course, inform everybody. And, okay. and you, you are. I, I know a lot of young people who watch you, so I'm sure. That in Sri Lanka? Important. Yes, they do. Okay. okay. When I mentioned so, it, when <laughs> I mentioned it that I was coming on your program, there was a lot of enthusiasm. Well, I'm glad we have had Sri Lankan support. Uh, no, I know you do. PRS. It's a big reason I've kept the English channel alive. We have a Hindi channel as well. Right. Grows much more aggressively because the audience is that much bigger. Of course, bigger. of course. But uh, Sri Lanka was one of the places in my mind because of which I kept the English channel alive, and yeah, here we are today. I'm glad. That's... Um. Again, no sharp question. This is sure. going to be, but I don't know how to not ask you this. The Rajapaksha family right now, geopolitically, it's not got a great name like outside Sri Lanka. At least that's a perception that Indians have. Is it true that the economic crisis was caused because of a bunch of wrong decisions taken by that family and the so-called corruption narratives around that family? Or would you like to draw out a parallel like opposite uh, opinion and again it's a very open-ended question I'm giving you the narratives I've heard on the show I might be totally wrong 
It's easy to demonize people in life. It right? helps you to, you know, position oneself. And uh, I mean, my view, uh, that's not the case often. Okay. It's easy to say, okay, so and so is the villain. Because I think as human beings, we prefer that. No? We feel comfortable if we know somebody else is a villain, somebody is a villain, and that's how it works. Also in today's day and age, I don't know what to believe on the internet. There's very so much true, propaganda very true, very flying true. around everywhere. Uh, I would just like to know your opinion. You see, our case, Sri Lanka, uh, this was a cumulative effect. The economic crisis had nothing to do with one individual or the other. I think every leader since independence, we received our independence in 1948, one year after you. And at that time, we had a healthy economy. The British, whatever you may say about, say, say about them, in the Sri Lankan context, they left a strong balance sheet, if you're talking in uh, private sector terms. Uh, we had, during the war, we had provided rubber for the war effort. We had uh, graphite for the war effort. So we had a good set of reserves. We had we were positioned very well. And Lee Kuan Yew, when he was uh, planning Singapore, visited Sri Lanka and went back and he said, uh, you know, he wants to make Singapore like Sri Lanka. This was in the 50s. And uh, subsequently, before he died, in his, he mentioned that he, Sri Lanka, India, that Singapore should never be like Sri Lanka, that he hoped it would be like Sri Lanka. So you can imagine within his lifetime how his opinion changed. Basically, what happened in my view, and this is my personal view, is that we spent more than we earned because we had money when we started. And we basically spent on social welfare, on uh, building a huge government service. You know, when the crisis struck, uh, about 80% of our revenues, that is what we earn as a government, was spent on salaries and pensions for government servants. Only 20% was left for everything else. So we had to borrow heavily just to pay for our public service. We have, let's say, 22 million people in Sri Lanka population about one and a half million people are working in government and another 500,000 are earning a pension from government and we don't have a pension fund. So two million people are earning directly from the government. So we just kept spending. As a result, there were good things also that happened to us. We have a very high standard of education. We have very high health care, high level of health care. Quality of life is very high. And uh, we have a uh, certain amount of infrastructure we have developed. So our people are, you know, basically uh, very competent. Well, then, and we have a very high quality of life, uh, have a high life expectancy also. But our problem is that we, we didn't have money to sustain this. So when uh, COVID struck, Ukraine war took place. And also our then president took a decision which... I think at that time was probably not the best decision to take. He said he wanted to shift away from chemical fertilizers to organic fertilizers. Uh, because he had the right reasons, maybe, because a lot of environmental issues were associated with that problem. So the combination of these factors affected our economy. But uh, to blame one family or one individual, it doesn't make... This is a collective decision, and every leader, I think, took decisions at that time, they thought they were the right decisions that they took. No leader says, I'm going to take a bad decision, but he's taking a decision in the context of information available to him or, or her, because we have women leaders on both sides also. But the, 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 so, so that, that was one aspect. The other is our income as a country. Our main uh, source of income is seven and a half million billion dollars coming from remittances from Sri Lankans working abroad. That is in the Middle East, uh, in uh, in Europe, in East Asia, wherever. They pour money back into the country. They, they, pour, they pour money. So that is number one, seven and a half billion dollars. Then number two is five billion dollars from apparel, uh, garments. We export a lot of garments to largely to the United States, about five billion dollars. We are very good at what we do there. We manufacture it well. It's high quality garments. For example, Victoria's Secret, for example. A lot of the lingerie is made in Sri Lanka. And, and it's, that's, a, that's a high end of that market. Uh, the, the, and then uh, swim, swim costumes, swimming suits. I mean, we, we have certain niches that we are very, very strong on. 
Now, there are we $5 billion we, we export, of which two-thirds we import the cloth, and so our value added is about $2 billion. Number three has been uh, basically tea. We all talk about tea, but tea is what the British gave us. Ceylon tea. Ceylon tea, exactly. Some of the best tea I've had in my life. Exactly. Right. Now, that is, that, is, that is a British legacy. We, are not, we did not have any tea before the British came. They brought it. They sure. first brought coffee. And then there was a blight which wiped out our coffee. Then they brought tea from China. But we only really export about $2 billion of tea. And a lot of our hill country, you visited some of the hill countries, we have the tea gardens there. It basically, that's the tea. Then about a billion dollars of information technology exports. So that's the lineup. Then we have tourism, which is this wild card. We have never been able to realize the full potential. The highest story we earned from tourism was, I think, 2018, about $4 billion. So it was that time, let's say, third place. Then COVID struck and it went right to zero. You know, there, there was each time there, there we had the Easter bombing, it dropped again. We have never been able to push this up. So these are our sources of income. So our leaders were not able to broaden the sources of income. And so the combination of these factors, we had our limited income sources. We were spending too much on, on, on our government and on welfare. That's where we ended up is where we are today. Effectively, it's a bunch of not the best business decisions. Exactly. If you are, a, if you, exactly. I mean, I very often tell my business friends, I mean, I come from a private sector background also. If if you ran, if we ran our country the way, 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 way if we ran a business the way we ran our country, we would have been bankrupt long ago. So that's, that's what we, countries don't go bankrupt. So, you know, therefore you, you know, you manage to go through. So now we have an opportunity that is to say we hit a crisis. We have now gone to the world, we are restructuring the economy. And, and I think that is the positive side here. We are looking, looking forward. Uh, and of course, this integration with India is what will get our economy moving. Because last year to this year, if you look at the last two years, our economy shrank 10% for over the last two years. Now, your economy is going to be growing seven, six and a half, seven percent So if you are able to hook on to your economy, whether it's tourism last month, for example, or this year so far, about 20 or 20% 20 of tourists are from India. So if we can hook on to tourism, we can do some of the other areas we are talking of, uh, electricity, ports, the port sector, uh, oil, you start integrating in different ways, then we can take off. Okay. No, I love okay. it. I love it. I'm no. getting to learn so much from you. From all that learning, it's clear. Yeah, all of it is registered. Like, um, I'll, again, I'll give you the emotional angle here. Okay. It's very cricket oriented. Right. Um, we want you to be as good a team as us cricket wise. Yeah. Like if, if, if by chance we see Sri Lanka not qualifying for one of the World Cups or one of the trophies, every Indian cricket fan feels like, bhai kya yaar, kam na. Like, that's like, it's a way of saying, brother, yeah, come yeah, on, yeah. be with us. So I know that it's very loose to attach cricket to geopolitical scenarios, but that's how Indians feel about Sri Lanka. I think cricket is life, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think it's it's uh, the bad thing to attach it that way. Um, and I know Dr. Jay Shankar does the same as well. Like I saw. I think in your podcast <laughs> also. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Um, no, but I love what you said. You basically said that since uh, Sri Lanka gained its independence, there were some wrong structuring decisions at the start, which actually over the years led to this moment. Now, um, I. Definitely know that the fertilizer uh, angle you, you spoke about was a slightly wrong decision, a wrong decision on behalf of the Rajapaksha family. My curiosity is then why has that family got so much negative PR globally? Like why have we received the news of like that family having, uh, you know, done wrong things? Like, again, I'm just giving you very Indian narrative, sir. Like, for example, I might ask you after this, what do you feel about PM Modi? Because I have a certain opinion as an Indian. I would love to know what a Sri Lankan thinks of PM Modi. In the same way, I'll tell you the opinion that we had of the Rajapaksha family is that I think they're very powerful. It's a, a family that's controlled politics for a, for a long time. Possibly it's that whole thing about hard times create hard men, hard men create soft times, soft times create soft men the world would categorize the family in that bracket of soft men because of what we see on the news about Sri Lanka's economic crisis. And I've gone to Sri Lanka. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. 
and when i had gone people were happy people were radiant everyone was hopeful there was positivity in the air and then on the news if you see these things about a food shortage or if i talk to my sri lankan friends who talk about economic uh, problems i really question that you know what what went so wrong like what what other decisions were taken like that so uh what i've gained from your answers that you said that it's easy to demonize people in the media because that's human nature when things are going wrong you say it's your fault like when things are going wrong especially economically say in a sri lankan's heart they're feeling almost like they are feeling like a victim they are a victim so there has been anger because of that victim feeling and that anger is directed into the rajapaksha family what is the truth about the rajapaksha family now what's happening if if mahind the rajapaksha had not been president probably we would, our war would not have ended wherever you may stand on the issue he was a man who had the courage to say okay we have tried enough now let us end this and at that time he was virtually a god in sri lanka this is 2009 2009 exactly okay since then maybe certain bad decisions were made maybe bad luck also uh, and today the society is more divided in sri lanka about the rajapaksas it is a fact i think with age i am more philosophical on these things you know history has to finally judge everybody it will judge you it will judge me so maybe we are too close to the situation now i mean i, I know these people personally i i mean as i said i worked with them i res- regard them respect them as well and when i talk like this there will be many people who will criticize me because it Sorry, is fashionable no. it is fashionable in social media to attack the rajapaksas today or to attack somebody else yeah. but but i am and that's not my nature i i don't think that is correct i think uh, let history judge who did what now the present president is trying very hard to put the country together there are many he has many critics large number of critics and the other day i saw him saying you know he doesn't expect to be loved by people he wants to get his work done so history will judge all of us i think but uh, today's world people are quick to judge very quick to judge and not sadly not quick to change your mind that's another problem people judge and then they become uh, you know persistent in that i think long form conversations like this can if they help i know shed some i know light. i know because my 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 view is i mean it's it's uh, they they i mean this whole idea of demonizing the rajapaksas i i don't think there is any benefit from that okay so, people maybe was there too much family in politics could be i mean that's another question one can discuss is if south asia has been full of family dynasties is that a good thing or a bad thing we can have a conversation on that i mean that's that's one issue uh, i personally don't believe in family politics i don't think that is that is a way to go but then that's maybe because i am not from a political family or, or whatever but uh, Uh, so th- those are conversations we could have but uh, i don't believe in demonizing individuals okay. i think okay um because this is a solution oriented podcast what's the current mindset about the bounce back i think i mean there is optimism we sri lankans are very resilient i hope it applies to our cricket as well of course yes and uh, we we are going to pounds back there is no doubt but it's going to be tough the next couple of years will be tough there is no question about it is is the biggest asset the sri lankans abroad it's a mix there is a problem here we see people going abroad there are a lot of people going abroad now that means we don't have enough people at home especially skilled people so we have doctors going abroad because the crisis push people out uh, engineers a uh, lot of professionals so that's an issue young people they prefer to go abroad because they don't have patience now you know because they 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 see on the internet all kinds of opportunities elsewhere and they say to hell with it we are not going to you know be here we get out so that's going to be the challenge we need to keep people who can get things done at home and uh, the remittances from abroad are important for the short term so we have to ensure that keeps coming that is bouncing back now it dropped during covid it dropped last year but but now it's bouncing back tourism we have to push and everybody watching this if yeah. they all visit if we, i think everybody watching our podcast if they visit sri lanka we are okay i i i would love to be a part of that change because i genuinely love your country like i you know i feel every place you visit leaves you with something 
uh, what I was left with from Sri Lanka was a lot of friendliness and a lot of peace. That's at least the experience I had. Okay. Uh, and there's way too much natural beauty in Sri Lanka for people not to see it once in their life. There's too much natural beauty. Like it is a very blessed land, but you need to actually see it from your own eyes to understand it. And also the brown person in me just loves all the brown people around. Because <laughs> when you're surrounded by white people or Asian people, you're just feeling a little bit out of place. A little bit. Like not that there's anything wrong with them. But it's always nicer to have brown people around. So no, it is, I think, for from what I can see now, a lot of people like to go to Goa. At least in Delhi, I don't know about Mumbai. And uh, Colombo is not that far away. So I'm not saying that they shouldn't go to Goa, but uh, Colombo can be the place oh, to yeah. go and then we are now trying to develop the gaming industry also there will be a fairly i think a world class casino coming up soon next by next year it will be in it will be in place so that's something wow. else that is interesting i don't gamble but i know there are many people who enjoy gaming so that will be another aspect so i think we we can you know we, we that's part of our bounce back tourism will be the quick win for us if we can make it happen on the apparel side, there is a challenge because already our garment exports have dropped about 20% because the U.S. market, is there is a slowdown there and they are not ordering their inventory. They have too much inventory. So I think it will take a little while for them to catch up. So this year it doesn't look good for the apparel industry, the garment industry. Okay. Um, so it's primarily tourism, the Sri Lankans well, abroad? A bit of the garment industry, but again, that's a volatile market. It could exactly, and okay. IT is another important. I said we had about a billion dollars worth, and you have some of our big companies there. HCL has invested there. I think Tata is looking at it as well. Uh, that's a sector, but that that relies on human resources. So if we have a lot of our young people getting out of the country, then you know that's a challenge. So we have to work on that. Okay. Uh, but your companies are very responsible that way. They actually pay for training in the IT sector when they come there. I notice uh, HCL does that. They give scholarships for young people to go to uh, study and then come back and join. So I, I, I would hope that more IT companies from here would go out there. Could you draw out a picture of the peak week of the economic crisis? Like what was happening in the life of an average Sri Lankan uh, versus what is happening today. Like now, if I go there this week, uh, I'm sure it's different scenarios. So what was happening? But I think the major sort of the, the blow up came over uh, when we ran out of foreign exchange and we were having a problem importing oil, petroleum and the gas. And especially in the urban areas, gas is important for cooking. So therefore, people who are living in apartments, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't get their gas. So some of them just came out and went out to demonstrate. They said, you know, this government must go. They can't even keep us, you know, we can't work in our kitchens. Then, of course, there were long lines for petrol. So transport became a problem. And, and if India had not stepped in, because you gave, and I keep repeating this because it should not be underestimated the role that you played. Um, the, the, uh, the, the India had not stepped in and Indian oil, you, you distribute uh, petroleum in Sri Lanka, you were able to bring petrol in and provide that to the market. It would have been worse. But what we had were queues, long queues, people sometimes two, maybe two, three days to get their cars pumped with petrol. So that was one scenario. Then in the, we have, like in India, we have a division, urban, rural. So in the rural areas, of course, the, this fertilizer decision did have an impact. The farmers were not getting their crops. They couldn't also get fertilizer. They were not able to get their uh, the insecticides, for example. So there was a crisis there for the crop. So the, the worst days were that. And then uh, today, there is no scarcity of uh, petroleum is available. Uh, most imports are available and slowly the government is opening out the economy. Uh, but of course, the, the challenge is the, uh, uh, the, the cost of living has gone. Inflation is being managed. But uh, the, the, uh, the, because we have no economic growth, there is uh, basically income sources are less now. 
So people's incomes are not enough to be able to buy buy uh, f- food they can buy, but their quality of life has become an issue. So today you have a situation where people who are middle class are suffering a lot. The poor, as you know, always suffer. They, they are the brunt of the burden of any economic crisis. But here the middle classes have also got pushed down, so people are finding it difficult to afford day-to-day requirements. And, and that is a problem at the moment. But goods are available. So if you have money, you can buy what you want. Earlier, even if you had money, you couldn't buy what you wanted. So that's that's a major difference. Uh, we have some issues in the health sector. We are trying to get uh, medicine, uh, import of medicines. Money is available, but we have to streamline that. Because India has also given some credit for medicines as well. Yeah, I don't know why I feel like saying this, but maybe an entrepreneurial way of looking at this is um, remote work culture, like working for foreign companies. I think that if one is in any form of a crisis, one should look at their own unfair advantages, at least from my little understanding of Sri Lanka. uh, And this is based on the fact that I've been there. Most of the Lankans I met can speak English, which is honestly a big advantage Mm -hmm. in terms of getting a job from abroad while working in Sri Lanka. So be it coding, be it even like creative jobs, Mm -hmm. like editing, media related, etc. And the other big advantage, at least I see that Sri Lankans have is at your core, you all seem like team players. Like whenever I speak to a Lankan guy and I have Lankan friends, there's a lot of team player energy, which also shows up in sport, etc. So, I mean, that's what I would nudge Sri Lankan youth towards. But who am I to say anything? I, I've not lived in your shoes. So I can't imagine what you guys are going through. But uh, subscribe to Beer Visors for more. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. No, no, but, uh, no, they should, I think. But uh, the, you know, it's an interesting point you about team players. I find our people are individualists. More than team players. Really? Yeah, we tend to be. Really? We are, we, are, we are very bright, very quick, but we, we are too individual. But uh, when there is a crisis, interestingly, we tend to mobilize. We, we do that. And, and that's where, I mean, that's the contradiction here. Day to day, we, we want to do things on our own the way we want to do them. And we, are, we don't want to, you know, work together or we want to compete with each other. Really? We, but if there's a real crisis, we come together. I think in Sri Lanka last year, you saw a few moments where people came together and said, let's forget about our religions, let's forget about our, our, our ethnicity, let's get the job done. Now, whether that spirit, you see it in cricket also, again, with Sri Lankans, you know, we all support, regardless of our views, uh, we support the cricket team. Uh, and in sport in general, Sri Lankans are like that. They support uh, whatever Sri Lankan teams they support. But then again, we go back to old habits. So maybe we have to get make that, uh, make, make, make it, make it make, find a way of making it work. Okay. Um, what's your perception of uh, the average Indian person, the human? Are, are we any different? I mean, from my experience, I find Indians, I mean, I'm very comfortable in India. My wife is very comfortable in India. And uh, I mean, Indians are friendly, Indians are caring. I have, I mean, everything I have to say about Indians would be very positive. And uh, we, we are, I mean, as I said, we are the same blood. And, but of course, you have different politics, you have different views, it's a huge country. But what I find also interesting is each state you visit, you have a totally different cultural yeah. context. I mean, it's quite remarkable. I and mean, we, we, we've traveled from Meghalaya to Tamil Nadu. Uh, you know, it's each an experience and the civilizational experience also because you have different uh, histories. Uh, so, I mean, I, all what I have seen about India has been positive in India. It's a bunch of micro countries stitched together. Yeah, but it works. You know, normally it's not easy to stitch India together. I mean, it's an idea it's, that is there that hold all of you together. And it's remarkable. I mean, it, it, uh, you, as a nation, you hold together. That's, that's, I mean, when you look at it, if somebody wrote it separately, you wouldn't think that it is possible. The fact that you have so many diverse uh, nationalities in the sense of ethnicities, uh, uh, religions, cultures, but okay. it, it, it works. What's your favorite Indian food? 
Many, many. Uh, that's that's too much too. If, I mean, if, if you it's if, if it's uh, <laughs> that's a good good question. I think uh, in Delhi, I would say the Dumpak restaurant there in the ah. ITC has a morel mushroom biryani. Right, right. I don't know whether you have yeah, tried. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. That would be one such okay. favorite. Wow, food. you've named a specific dish from a well, specific you restaurant. Ask me what is the what, <laughs> what is your favorite? <laughs> Just when I I was trying to visualize immediately, I, a lot of ideas came to my mind, but that one. So sure. that Sri, was the moment. Sri Lankan food is similar to Chettinad food, like for me. Chettinad and Kerala also. Yeah. Kerala, it's a mix. It's hot like Chettinad food, I think. And yes, it's a mix. Okay. We, we have, I mean, we have our own identity also, but it's a mix of these two together. Yeah. Uh, I like Chettinad food also, okay. obviously. Kerala food. I, I, I like love also. Sri Lankan food. Like there's okay. actually a couple of Sri Lankan restaurants I keep ordering from. So a lot of kotu okay. roti, coconut based curries. It's like exactly my uh, We palate. use a lot of coconut. I mean, and for us, uh, I think uh, they say that to the American Indian, the Red Indian, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the bison, they said represented everything. Mm. For us, it's a coconut, coconut. tree because <laughs> it, we eat every aspect of it. We use the shell as a utensil, the, the uh, trunk is used for building rafters for roofs. The, the leaves are used for uh, roofing as yeah. well. And then for decorative purposes, we use the flower. I mean, every aspect. And then we make our alcohol from coconut as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, everything, I, everything is coconut. You no, know, I got to talk about this a little bit. Uh, you know, I'll give you a very Indian perspective on Sri Lanka. When I was traveling there, one of my first thoughts was so scenic. And it's almost like someone's um, kind of created this sibling of Kerala. Uh, you feel a lot of parallels between the two, be it landscape, be it uh, culture. But you guys are a very different culture also. There's some very specific things. And again, the Sri Lankans I met were extremely friendly. Um, extremely gorgeous. I have to say that also. <laughs> but uh, the guys I met were extremely friendly. Um, you feel very comfortable there. Uh, which is why, you know, at the start of this conversation, so you were constantly in, in our chatter, you were constantly bringing up like a slightly violent past. You kept saying that, which as a tourist, I can't visualize. Like even so, look at you, like you're, you're so friendly, like, you know, your energy is so positive, radiant. It's in many ways, the land of the Buddha in the modern world. So I don't get that violence angle. And again, my assumption is that this is all political propaganda fueling sides I, against I each other. I think you are right. I, I mean, you, first you mentioned about Kerala. Actually, if you close your eyes in, in the south of Sri Lanka, you when you go to, let's say, Cochin and you open your eyes just on the street, you wouldn't <laughs> see a difference because right. you are quite right. I mean, our food is very similar. Our, the way we dress our elephants, our roof, the roofs of the uh, the temples, the Kerala temples are similar as well. And we have had that connection, I think. And then we have uh, the, the uh, even the drumming Keralites have a very sophisticated history of drumming as well. That's a good comparison. But of course, we clearly have our unique identity and that's something we are proud of and the civilizational identity as well. The violence I, I something I also wonder about. I mean, we why we need why it has happened because our post-independence history has been violent. There is no doubt. Thirty years after the seventy-five years of independence, thirty years we went through this war. Uh, we have had other insurrections also that are very violent. More recently, this Easter bombing that took place. Why is it in this small island that we are capable of such violence? Politics has a lot to do with it. I think you are quite right again, and irresponsible politics. And uh, we need to rethink that. But then we also, as people, must reflect, because finally we are a democracy. Since 1931, we have elected our leaders, men and women in Sri Lanka since 1931, even under British rule, we have elected our leaders. So we, we need to, I think, uh, reflect on it. I mean, what have we done right and what have we done wrong? and then find a solution because uh, for a way forward, we really need to understand that. You know, why, why is it that we suddenly explode like that? And then, uh, and, and politicians, definitely, 
everywhere in the world they use extremism as we discussed earlier because it is convenient but uh, i think we as citizens need to be more responsible as well i think and reflect on it and maybe what happened last year is a important moment there is a lot of discussion going on in our society about it i hope the outcome is positive because sometimes it can lead to other conclusions and i hope we don't go there uh so i think the next election we will have another election in about a year's time i mean i find this i mean being a democracy you can have elections at any point but at least at the moment i think the thinking is in about another year's time and i hope people will look at the situation more responsibly let's see yeah is your country entrepreneurial mixed we we okay. have you see our private sector parts of it have been uh, insulated protected and then even that's why when you open out with the indian market some people are frightened because they think they cannot compete because there are too much imports coming in i think we need to create that culture of entrepreneurship more especially the majority singhala community needs to be more entrepreneurial i think this is a personal view that i'm saying i'm putting forward i think we need to do that and and i think the youth think in an entrepreneurial way i also think the fact that so many people have left sri lanka and are doing well is an indication that obviously if they can do well abroad they should be able to do well at home uh, but i think we need to, uh, to to i think catalyze more entrepreneurship entrepreneurship now i but i notice what is happening in places like bangalore where you have incubators and you have you know this government i think our successive governments in sri lanka uh, have uh, basically tried to tell people don't worry we look after everything you know we look after you from cradle to grave and that's what crashed our economy also because we were trying to do that from you know we give you everything free because we have free healthcare we have free education all the way through university these are good things if you know you are able to afford them uh, then we have a large welfare program and that has i think made people too dependent on government and that entrepreneurial spirit has i think got uh, in some ways uh, it has been pulled out so we need to push that and maybe this crisis is the opportunity for that yeah. because i think by and large sri lankans do well when they go abroad that's a question we must you know uh, ask how is it that they are doing so well there and we are not doing too well as a country yeah um again as they say tough times build tough people so i anticipate that we're going to see a whole new tough generation that's come out of this crisis and this phase one one hopes one hopes and that's what we should i think push for so milan sir that was the podcast for today uh I know there was some intense questioning but I represent like the Indian youth in many ways and my intention was to just bring out the truth because I feel that people have opinions about Sri Lanka especially in the last one or two years where India has become geopolitically very active like the average person knows about geopolitics so rather than us just forming opinions I would actually learn from a Sri Lankan like yourself especially someone as knowledgeable as you so sorry if i crossed any line with you no no you didn't at all yeah. and we didn't at all my intention is uh dual one to definitely reach out to sri lankans through this uh podcast because maybe i feel a sense of friendship or brotherhood because i've been there uh and you know as india does with sri lanka you guys are our brothers like there is the same blood flowing through our veins so uh that is one definite intention but secondly it was to educate people about sri lanka especially indians i feel a countries need to come together more be it in terms of hard power or soft power so all the questions and everything i put you through in this episode came from that place so thank you for taking it head on like you answered like so much people don't open up the way you do it makes me respect sri lankans even more you're just another great sri lankan i've met shout out to my boy dasun uh, <laughs> uh but well, i hope you visit soon that's uh, part I, of the it's my promise agenda to you. here conspiracy is to, to come back soon <laughs> it's my promise to visit soon so there's a lot of uh intermingled culture that i hope to explore as you can see there's a lot of buddha elements I in know, our I know. office as well so i will visit hopefully i'll bring palgar and poche my mentor uh, with me as well yes, uh, i bow down to you sir 
Thank you. Thank you very much Trust for me, the opportunity. Yes, I just feel a lot of brotherhood towards all of Sri Lanka. And I just hope we hosted you well on today's episode. You did very much, and thank you again for this opportunity. Oh. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, sir. This meant you. a lot that you came home. And thank, thank you. you for your your team as well. Yes. Everybody here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was the episode for today. I'd love to know what you guys thought of today's episode because it is slightly experimental for us. I'm very open to doing more geopolitical chats like this with people who aren't Indian. We've already done so many geopolitics specials. with indian citizens but it's about time that we bring on citizens from other countries as well if you're a new listener especially if you're a sri lankan listener please go and check out the massive library of episodes that we've already created on trs for the regular trs listeners keep supporting us because ranveer and the team will be back soon make sure you support milan sir i've linked all his handles down below lots of love to you guys i hope you enjoyed today's episode